Scripture reading today is from Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 to 25. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man, and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angels of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Christ. Christ. <clears throat> Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, today I invite us to think about the virgin birth the virgin conception of Jesus. And we will be looking um, at two scriptures today. It's Matthew chapter 1, um, verses 18 to 25, and Luke chapter 1, verses 26 to 35. So, uh, let us, we will be comparing and looking at both, comparing both texts and looking at them together. So let us begin with Matthew uh, chapter 1, uh, verse 18 and 19. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. So this is what Matthew tells us. He says, when his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. 
So, uh, first of all, we need to understand that Matthew is describing uh, all the events uh, surrounding the birth of Jesus uh, from the uh, uh, from the perspective of Joseph, right? So he is kind of telling Joseph's story, whereas as Luke, Luke in his turn, he is talking more about Mary's experiences and Mary's perspective. But in any event, we know that back then there was this tradition for people who wanted to marry, they would be betrothed, which means that they would agree that would make a covenant uh, to <clears throat> live uh, for one year and wait and see uh, if they are faithful to one another. So if something happens, uh, most importantly, if um, the girl uh, becomes pregnant, so that would be a sign that she's unfaithful and that would be uh, in Deuteronomy, in the Old Testament, that would be a reason uh, to stone her, to kill her with stones. So in the times, uh, in the time of Mary and Joseph, they would no longer stone, they would no longer kill uh, such a girl, but they would just divorce. And we can see that when they find out that Mary is pregnant, Joseph, his initial uh, response to this is that she probably was unfaithful or maybe she was raped. In any event, so she has a child, right? So he doesn't know that this is a child from God. He doesn't know anything. So, uh, but he's also a just man, a righteous man, and he cares for her and he loves her. He doesn't want to create any public display. He doesn't want to make it public. He wants to divorce her quietly. He wants to protect her and to cover her. Right? So this is, this is, this is what we see. Joseph, at the very beginning, he doesn't realize, he doesn't understand what is happening. Right? Mary, on the other hand, she knew what was happening because if we go to look, and you can see two different colors, so the, the blue slide is from Matthew, this uh, kind of like brown, brownish slide is from Luke. So now we go to Luke, uh, chapter 1, verse 26, and we see what the Apostle Luke is recording uh, from Mary. In the sixth month uh, of Elizabeth, and uh, Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist, so she was pregnant uh, for six months, and this is uh, to what this refers, in the sixth month of her pregnancy, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. Okay, so we have an angel, uh, and the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God, and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. We can see how these two stories <clears throat> uh, connect. Uh, the, story is the story in, in Matthew and the story in Luke. He will be great and he will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. Okay? So, now we can see that Mary, she knew 
that she will become pregnant and she knew that this is a supernatural event so she had this encounter with the angel Gabriel and also she knew what was happening to her was from the Holy Spirit so now I want us to think a little bit about this, about the virgin conception and the virgin birth. So we know that uh, around 18th century, 200 years ago, um, many uh, Christians and pastors and theologians, because you know it was the age of rationalism, they started considering miracles something uh, impossible and all of a sudden they started looking at the Bible and all the miracles um, as something like stupid silly stories and today if you think about people say atheists uh, so they they would say right away well you know the virgin birth the virgin conception this is ridiculous these things don't happen right these things just don't happen and if you look at witnesses at testimonies of people testimonies of people who were atheists and then became Christians they would say that uh, the biggest problem I mean they would gladly accept Jesus as a moral teacher yeah Jesus teaches and preaches about love this is great but what they would find difficult to believe would be the resurrection of Jesus from the dead and then the virgin conception right so is it possible I mean it's kind of like some you know Christians many Christians don't have that problem they just accept it as a matter of faith and they just say well you know I believe that this is what happened I don't question that but more and more people they've been questioning this and some Christians and pastors and theologians they would just um, become really shy and they would feel very awkward about this uh, to the point that they either would omit this virgin conception altogether or they would try to say well it's a little bit mythological it's, 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 uh, it's uh, some sort of a fairy tale some sort of embellishment but we need to understand, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, that the virgin conception is super important. You cannot just dismiss it because for Jesus to be able to die on the cross for the sins of the entire world, he had to be sinless, without sin. His birth should be different from a regular natural birth of, 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 of human, of a human, right? If he was just like, if he had a father, Joseph, uh, and a mo mother, you know, Mary, and then he was born as a, a simple, mere human being, then his death on the cross cannot cover the sins of the world, right? So he had to be, he had to be, 100% human and 100% divine okay so that was super important that is why we Christians we cannot just dismiss it as oh okay just just myth now let us just ponder a little bit let us meditate let us think about this uh, <clears throat> the entire world around us uh, today would teach us something that what is called naturalism naturalism and naturalism it's basically rejection of miracles well miracles don't happen we don't see people being raised from the dead we don't see a uh, virgin conception we don't see all those things uh, that is why people would, would would think it is not possible at all it's just a fairy tale it's just a myth so it's naturalism, we call it naturalism, we believe just in what we can see, in what we can touch, in what we can observe. On the other hand, <clears throat> supernaturalism, so it's line three, supernaturalism, it's when you believe that miracles, including the resurrection and the virgin conception, is possible. 
Now, I would like us to analyze a little bit experiences of those um, uh, Christians who are scientists or scholars, and they used to be atheists, and now they are Christians. And they would say, you know, they, I mentioned that before, they would say that one of the biggest obstacles was the virgin conception, and they, they would just, they just would say, well, I cannot wrap my mind around this. I see Jesus, he preaches and teaches all those beautiful things, love your neighbor, you know, take care of the poor, he's so good, but, but this, this is impossible. Now, what would help them to change their mind? Now, strangely enough, it would be the origin of the universe. So what do we know about the origin, origin of the universe? How did our universe uh, come into being? So now, if you go to uh, today's uh, science, you will see that atheists who do not believe in Jesus, who do not believe in the Bible, who do not believe in the virgin birth, the virgin conception, they believe in something interesting, which is extra natural. So I will explain what it means. When we say naturalism, we are talking about what we have around us, and it's time, space, and matter. Time, space, and matter. Right? So this is what uh, we call nature. This is what we call the universe. Everything around us is time, space, and matter. So now, if you talk about the origin, origin of the universe, when did it uh, appear? So the standard answer today, science gives us, so it's Big Bang Theory, right? So which means that the universe came into existence out of nothing. Okay, let me repeat it again. The universe, the standard exp scientific explanation of the origin of the universe today is that the universe came into being, came into existence out of nothing. Okay? So this is the standard explanation. So, which means at some point there was no time, no space, no matter. Okay? That sounds like a miracle to me. Right? There is nothing. And then out of complete nothing, we see time, space, and matter appearing, and then the universe appears, and then all the elements of the universe, and then all of a sudden we have all the things, you know, stars and planets and everything. And all that came into being from nothing. Okay, so that sounds like a miracle. So, which means, even if you are an atheist, even if you believe only in what you can touch and measure, you still have to admit, or you still have to, you still believe that at the very beginning of the origin of the universe, there was nothing. So, if we can believe that as atheists and non-Christians, right, if we can believe that, that out of nothing, everything appeared, so then we can definitely believe the virgin conception and virgin birth and the resurrection. So, things, we, things that surround us, uh, or, or let me put it different, the world that is around us is full of miracles. If we think in terms of um, in terms of uh, how the universe is created, or how it functions, how it, how, how, how it exists, right? So, and if even atheists, non-Christians, admit those miracles, right? So that it opens for us possibility that the resurrection any miracle in the scriptures is possible. So, 
we as Christians, we also believe that, yeah, we have this universe and we have all the laws of the universe, but we also believe that the creator of the universe can interfere. For example, if I want to drop uh, this pointer, so it will fall down because it is the law of gravity, okay? If I let it fall down, it is going to fall down on the floor. So this is the law of gravity. But if I interfere and catch it, so I don't let this thing to fall on the floor. I interfere, right? God, the creator of the universe, he can interfere at certain points. So even rationally, we can understand that the virgin conception is possible, okay? So now, the Bible just states those facts to us, right? So the Holy Spirit will overshadow you. And you, whatever you will conceive is from the Lord. And uh, in the Bible, say in, in, in Matthew uh, chapter 1 and 2, you will see that the, the Lord never says that to Joseph that this is your son. It just says a son. So in Luke chapter one, when uh, when uh, God is talking to the father of of uh, John the Baptist, he says, "Your wife will bear you a son." Okay, this is your son. In case of Joseph, it's always God's son. Okay. So now let us go back. So this is Matthew. Uh, we had a look at, at Luke and how Luke describes this, uh, tells us the story uh, which he very likely learned from Mary herself about the angel. Uh, but as he considered these things, Joseph, he wanted to divorce her quietly, you remember. Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Okay? It's from the Holy Spirit. Now, Joseph knows as well, right? So Mary knew it from the very beginning. Now, the Lord, in a supernatural way, reveals it to Mary. Uh, to, to Joseph as well. So she will bear a son, not she will bear you a son, a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, which is Yeshua, which is uh, Jehovah saves, right? For he will save his people from his sins. And all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, you know the prophet Isaiah, so it's chapter 7, verse 14. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Some people would try to dismiss uh, this virgin birth by saying, <clears throat> okay, this is... Uh, this is a story that was borrowed from prior mythologies. They would say, well, religion existed before Jesus Christ, and uh, we can find, they would say, we can find in those religions um, a God or someone who was born of a virgin, uh, was born on December 25th, uh, died, uh, was crucified and uh, was raised from the dead. So, and they would try to say, look, there are these similarities between Jesus and these previous gods, Egyptian gods or Persian gods, and what Christians did, they just borrowed all those ideas from those religions. And uh, <clears throat> these critics, they uh, rely on the fact that many people never go and check those stories, okay? So, 
If you want to know about previous religions and previous stories, for example, they give an example, Horus. Horus was an Egyptian god, and they would say Horus uh, was born of a virgin, died, uh, raised, was raised on the third day. And they would say, well, Horus, this Egyptian god, well, Jesus is just a copy of this Horus. So now, when you are told this, what do you do? You need to ask this question. You need to ask, how did you come to this conclusion? And you need to go and look at the sources, at least, right? And if you go to the sources, you will see that Egyptologists, they will tell you that it's absolutely made up. Horus was never born of a virgin. Horus was born of Isis, and uh, so he had two parents, one god and Isis was his mother, so it's another goddess. And he was never crucified, and he, we don't know about his death, it, it's never discussed, and there is no this portion that he was raised on the third day. It's absolutely made up, but you can see that on the internet. And very often when you see debates, and you see people asking questions, you know, uh, debates on campuses, debates about Christ and, you know, Christianity. People will bring that uh, up as a fact. Oh, but you know, Horus, he was like, you know, Jesus. This is not true. He was, we cannot see in prior mythologies anybody born of a virgin. So there is another Persian god, Mithras, who they would say, well, Mithras was born of a virgin and he had 12 disciples, and then he gave flesh to his followers to feast on. And they would say, well, it resembles Jesus, because Jesus had 12 disciples, and Jesus was born a virgin, and Jesus gave uh, flesh and blood to his disciples. And this is another made-up uh, uh, comparison, because Mithras was not born of a virgin, he was born of a rock, you know? a stone, a piece of stone, according to his legend, right? So there is no virgin birth at all. And he didn't have 12 disciples, he had only two disciples. Okay, and he didn't give them his own flesh like Jesus, but he gave them the flesh of the bull, which he sacrificed. But you need to understand how many attacks the, uh, are there on the on Jesus and the virgin birth of Jesus, right? So there are so many critics who would try to destroy they, they would try to destroy Christmas for us, right? But we need to we need to analyze and see and when you analyze and you, you see all those claims about oh Jesus well you know him being born of a virgin we can find it in previous literature. No 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 we cannot find it. It is absolutely unique. So now, again, pagan mythologists, when they t talk about, they, they have those stories when gods have intercourses with human uh, women, you know, and then, you know, uh, uh, a child may be born. But all those pagan stories, say Greek and Roman stories about Zeus and, you know, they are all uh, different in a way. So they are gods. They la lust. They lust. They have sexual passions and desires. They, they lust after women. And then by deceiving those women, they impregnate them. They have sexual intercourse. Definitely we don't see anything like that in the story of Jesus. God the Father, there is no sexual you know, tension, there is, I mean, it's all pure, it's all sober, it's absolutely different. So we can dismiss uh, this criticism when people say, well, you know what, in prior mythologies we have virgins giving birth to, no, that, that is not true, we, we don't see that. Okay, some even would say Buddha was also born of a virgin. So if you go to all the sources about the birth of Buddha, he was never born of a virgin. He was born of regular human beings, uh, you know, kings, but not virgin. Okay, so it's 
Je Jesus' birth is absolutely unique. Some people would say, well, you know what? This virgin birth is so ridiculous. It was added later. Later, Christians were looking at the story of Jesus and they wanted to make him um, look good and look like God and they added later these things. Now, if we go and analyze the text of, of the Gospel of Luke and the Gospel of Matthew, we will see that these texts are very early. Okay? How do we know that the Gospel of Luke and the Gospel of Matthew are early, which means are very close to the time of Jesus and Mary and Jesus' brothers? Well, because in those Gospels the destruction of Jerusalem is not mentioned. Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD, right? So, Gospels don't mention this, but this was a major event, the destruction of Jerusalem, the destruction of the Temple. If the Gospels were written late, the destruction of Jerusalem would be mentioned. So, what does it mean? Why do we need to know that the Gospels were written early? That means, and we can, we, we, we have all the reasons to believe that, say, the Gospel of Luke was written around 50 AD, which means Mary was still alive. Mary was still alive, and when Luke was getting his information about the birth of Jesus, he possibly, it's very likely, he was able to interview Mary and also the brothers of Jesus, right? So Jesus' family is, is around. Uh, the Christian community, everybody knows those stories. Now, this claim that Christians added the virgin birth later to make Jesus look good, look like the Son of God, they, 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 they fall apart. Because uh, for Mary, I mean, and that the, the only witness of this will be Mary, and uh, the one who gives this testimony is Mary, she doesn't have any reason to make this up. So, on the contrary, claims that she conceived, or what was conceived in her is from the Holy S Spirit, was so strange to the Jewish audience that if Mary wanted to make up these kind of stories, they will make her look bad. People would immediately say, hey, she's making this up, we don't see that very often, we don't see this in the Old Testament. She was probably unfaithful to Joseph, and she's just trying to make up those stories. So, all the critics, all the opponents, they would use it against Mary, this idea of the virgin conception. So, which, which means that the fact that she's talking about this is just because it's happened, right? It doesn't elevate her, it doesn't get, I mean, in, in her, in her, uh, in her um, certain context, right? In her environment, she has nothing to gain from this. On the opposite. She will give her critics and opponents an opportunity to say, hey, she's coming up with these stories because she has something to cover. And she's already an old lady, and she doesn't need all that. Can you imagine old lady just, oh, okay, how Jesus was born? And she's, and she's going around making up these stories about the virgin conception, right? So it's very unlikely at all that she was making it up. It's unlikely... Uh, we do not see any evidence that Christians added this virgin conception later. But what we can see, we can see that, yeah, uh, Jesus' family are still around, so James and Jude, Mary is still around, and, and Luke is recording this story. So if it was just made up, or crazy addition, or something, uh, they either 
avoid, would avoid, have avoided this altogether, or they would make up something different, which is not so crazy, right? So, I just wanted us to consider from different angles the virgin birth of Jesus. I know that West Christians, we may believe this and we don't need any uh, evidence or proof, or uh, so, so we, we, we just believe it. But we also need to know that nowadays more and more people would criticize the Bible, would criticize the reliability of the Gospels, would criticize, they would say, well, Luke made up this, Matthew made up this, and these uh, naturalism, naturalistic worldview, even among Christians, is so prevalent that many Christians at the subconscious level do not believe in miracles. And we go through all this, oh, okay, virgin birth, okay, so we don't take it seriously, but we need to take it seriously, right? So if the Lord is the creator of the universe, he has control over all laws. And even if atheists believe that the universe came into being out of nothing, which is sort of a miracle and mind-blowing and crazy, right? So out of nothing. So we can believe in the virgin birth. Because the universe coming out of nothing into existence is also a virgin conception in a way, right? Out of nothing in a very crazy, unusual way. So, uh, I would like us to be strong in our understanding of the virgin conception and virgin birth. I would like, I want you to, to understand that it is not borrowed from any myth and any religion prior to Christianity. It just false, the statement that it was borrowed, it's wrong, it's false. We do not see any evidence of this. We do not see any evidence of, any reasonable evidence or explanation of that it was, the virgin birth was added later by Christians to make look Jesus or Mary, uh, to elevate them and just to, uh, to, to, to make them look good. We don't see any evidence of that, okay? And we can see, in the light of what we know about science and everything around us, that there is a door for us for extra natural and supranatural, and I would say even supernatural. So, I invite you to pray. Dear Jesus, we thank you so much for the accounts of Matthew and Luke of your birth. And we, Jesus, strongly believe that you were conceived by the Holy Spirit and that you are 100% man and you are 100% God. And we know, Jesus, that you, you have done that so that you can save your people from their sins. And we are your people, Jesus. We know that you died on the cross, and because you are sinless, your, your sacrifice is perfect. And your sacrifice satisfies the law of God and the wrath of God completely. And that gives us joy, Jesus. We are so glad, we rejoice that a Savior was born unto us. And may your name, Jesus, be magnified and glorified. You are our Savior, our King, our brother, our friend, our Father, our Redeemer. We love you so much, Jesus. Amen. Mm -hmm.